I'll tell you, there's going to be an intermediate period. I'm going to uh, I'm going to teach uh, on um, winning a soul to Christ for a couple Sundays. It's been I don't know a year and a half, two years since I've done that. So um, that should interest if you like just a refresher on it. Some of you've heard it so many times that you can just about teach it for me. But that's good. That's how you learn by repetition. I want to mention something. About, you know, I was enthralled by um, I think it was Robbie that, was, that read. Uh, about the third law of thermodynamics, and somebody else may have brought it up. And uh, so I kind of looked over those first three laws. I think there's four. Is there four laws? Whatever, huh? Oh, okay. Rachel. Yeah, it's. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, we don't want to be sexist, do we? No, it was my daughter. Should have known better. Anyway, um, but I looked at the first three laws, and you know, if you can get through the scientific ease, um, I want to mention these three briefly and how they relate uh, to the Bible. And remember, I told you that this that's real must line up with this that is eternal. That's just all there is to it. If God created it, and those those two don't contradict one another, how could they? And this just this goes right along with that. The first law of thermodynamics is what they call the, uh, um, the conservation of energy. Um, states that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. And what that boils down to is I could light this sheet of paper on fire, and all it will can do is convert to something else. It'll convert to light, heat, it'll convert to a gas, uh, and even wind up burnt carbon. So it's just changing form. You can't really get rid of it. Um, I mean, you can get rid of the sheet of paper as the sense it's no longer a sheet of paper, but all the building blocks of that thing are still there. And this law's for man, not God, obviously. And it just goes to show you, that law shows you that man cannot destroy God's creation. We can change it, but we can't destroy not one fragment of it. It's all still there. And God, and which is interesting because Ecclesiastes says, What God doeth, he doeth forever. So everything that exists, whether what form it is, it's all still there. The basic building blocks. Um, what's that thing where you, you, you uh, Rumple Stilskin would try to spin the straw into gold? What's that called? Alchemy. You know, man's always wanted to be able to be an alchemist. Because, look, if you can take lead and turn it into gold, right? I mean, all you got to do is put some more protons and neutrons in, in the center of that thing. That's all there boils down to. It's all protons, neutrons, and electrons. The more protons and neutrons, it changes the element. So man would love to be able to... Well, God, can, God does that. Uh, he can he can turn water into wine. He can turn uh, he can take bread and fish and all of a sudden multiply it because all the building blocks of this universe are at his disposal. So when we think of something being utterly destroyed, not really. The Lord can come back and put it right back together again. See, which brings up the second law. <laughs> The second law of thermody thermodynamics, don't make me say that three times, um, has to deal with, uh, and, and when you look up entropy, it'll give you 50 different, it's related, to, it's related to heat, heat energy, but it's the kind of energy that's left that doesn't do any work, it's useless. That is the way everything degrades into useless energy. Entropy, we say, uh, entropy is increased. In other words, and also has to do with, let me give you some words, decay, randomness, disorder, chaos. Because that energy doesn't do anything. It, it, it's just chaos. It's like if I take a, a glass of water and I nudge it and it goes over the side, are we going to get a swimming pool or are we just going to get a broken glass with water spread everywhere and we have chaos, we have disorder, right? That is the natural, in any, in any system, especially a closed system, which this universe is a closed system, and in any, um, um, what am I trying to say here? The words are leaving me. Where you have a, um, 
a reaction, a chemical reaction, a spontaneous chemical reaction, entropy is always increased. So what's that tell you? Evolution is an impossibility by the laws of thermodynamics. It's impossible. It would be like putting a typewriter in a dryer, turning it on for 100,000 years, and getting an IBM computer at the end. Because you have more disorder. You have more... Th this, everything's winding down. I don't think anybody's growing any younger. Okay? Doesn't look that way. The, your car's not getting better. And if you do um, become healthy, you put a tremendous a lot of energy in. And it takes a long time to get that physique you want and a lot of work. So when you're not putting energy in something and it's by itself, it, it just falls to pieces. The whole universe is falling to pieces. Why? God's not putting any energy into it. He said, I'm done. And he just pulled his hand back. And now everything just kind of just collapses. And here on earth, the only time we make something, we manufacture something or we build something or we maintain something, we have to put energy into it. Work. But it's always a lot more work than what we get out of it. And then it starts decaying again. <laughs> okay, here's the insane part. Dating evolution by a system of decay is insanity. It's insanity. And I don't know, I mean, I don't know what's wrong with these scientists and this, they're just trying to get their grant money. But just living this life and just watching everything fall apart, watching everything you own turn to junk or quit working, or watching everything just, you know, degrade over time unless somebody comes along does some work. This is throughout the entire universe. It's a closed system and no energy is going into it, and therefore it's decaying. <laughs> it's not getting better. Evolution, I mean, evolution brings you to a man with, who's got all these complex systems. That's not, that's not true. It takes, it takes a, a creator to do this, where you have these complex systems that work in unity to one another, just the human body, just incredibly complex. It could not have happened by chance. And then you're talking about everything else out there by chance. Come on. Quit kidding yourself. Quit kidding the kids and trying to get them to believe something that they know is not true. Any scientist is worth their salt. These are laws that, are, that govern our universe. These aren't mine. These are laws God put into place, and man recognizes these laws. There's one more. The third law, which I thought most interesting, Rachel, and, um, and what it states that, that if, you, if you can bring a temperature to absolute zero, which is zero degrees Kelvin, that's supposedly what absolute zero is, that molecular movement ceases to ceases to move, and therefore their entropy is zero. And heaven talks about, in Revelation um, 4, verse 6, it talks about heaven where there's a sea of glass like unto crystal, and it talks about a, a perfect crystalline structure where there is zero entropy. And yet your Bible tells you that there's a crystal sea up there. And... Above this universe, and that's what we're talking about, above this universe, this face of this deep is frozen. And it is so cold, there's no molecular movement, there's no entropy, there's no loss of energy. Now, if God can do that for heaven, he can do it for here. Or he can just keep infusing energy into it. You know where the grass never dies, the flower never fades? <laughs> he can do that. He chooses not to do it now because it's in a fallen state. But every one of those laws, it's perfect. Exactly what the Bible says. Lines right up with the Bible. Why? God created this. So, now if I understood more, I would, I'd tell you more, but I'll tell you what. They start whew, getting real heady on me on the, on the, on the language. I mean, just trying to find a definition of the word entropy is just amazing. You know, everybody's got a little bit different uh, take on it. But boy, it's going on all the time. Order or disorder, chaos, randomness, that is what, that, I mean, 
You and I both know that's what governs our lives. All this stuff's going on, and we're trying to make some order out of it. And then sometimes we have to ask God to make some order out of it. But it is falling to pieces, and so are you. <laughs> Just a matter of time. Anyway, uh, we're talking about this body of water right here called the Great Deep. That right there. How big, I don't know. I think somewhere in the Bible you could find the depth, the height, and the length, and I believe it's there, but I don't know how to find it. Uh, Dr. Ruckman said that if uh, Einstein had been a, a Bible believer instead of a, a Bible denier, he might have figured some of these things out. I mean, somebody that understands the Bible so, way ahead, so far ahead of science, um, there's no end to what they might be able to discover if they were just open to God's revelation. But turn to 2 Samuel chapter 22, because Christ had to come through this sea at the advent. He had to make his way through that sea. Uh, 2 Samuel 22, and we're going to read from verse 8 to verse 17, and I'm going to try to move quickly though. Um, it says, Then the earth shook and trembled, the foundations of the heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, a fire out of his mouth devoured, coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down. It almost sounds like being able to bend um, space. He bowed the heavens, I, just a thought. He bowed the heavens also and came down. The darkness was under his feet. Um, outer space is pitch darkness. Very dark. Unless you got the sun blazing in on you. I mean, it's pretty dark. And he rode upon a cherub and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And I can tell you this, there are such things as solar winds. There are uh, winds out there in the, uh, in the heavens, not just here on earth. And he made darkness pavilion. Well, you can even have, you can even have waves of energy coming at you. Um, that happens quite a bit with the sun. We get waves of energy. And he made darkness pavilions round about him. Again, with, and it says, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. And we, and we, we showed, or I showed you last week, the skies and uh, when he talks about, uh, uh, he could be talking about the sky as far as the outer space is concerned, not just the sky above our head or directly above our head. Uh, Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled, the Lord thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered His voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. And the channels of the sea appeared, and the foundations of the world, now that doesn't necessarily just mean the earth, the foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord, the blast of the breath of His nostrils. He sent from above, He took me, He drew me out of many waters. So not only does the Lord come through that body of water, but he's going to take us through that body of water. And, you know, the, 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 of course, the picture is the Red Sea, which I'll get to in a minute. But uh, look at Matthew 12, 40. The Lord teaches you through pictures and, and types, um, contrasts, all different kinds of ways he teaches. And one of them, you know, he said, There shall no sign be given the children of Israel, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. <laughs> and we think, oh yeah, death, burial, resurrection. But there's more to it than that. In um, Matthew 12, 40, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, the thing is that the whale's belly was under the water, and the heart of the earth is under the water. And this universe is under the water. And over and over again, he's, he's re-emphasizing that. Uh, turn to Matthew chapter 3. This was a, a big question for me. Even John questioned him about this, John the Baptist. Why am I baptizing you? Well, there's another reason. It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily about the death, burial, and resurrection, although it pictured that. It wasn't just about um, a sinner that's repent and, you know, and gets in the water and raised the newness of life. and uh, It's a picture of that, although it wasn't, neither of those were a picture for his sake. But look, look what he says there. Um, he says, Then cometh Jesus, this is Matthew, thir Matthew 3, 13 to 17. 
Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. He comes out of that water. He goes down into that water and he comes back up. You know what he did? He came down here and then he ascended up on high. There's that picture. Because it wasn't a picture of a sinner getting saved. <laughs> because he said, why, do, why should I be baptized in you? Well, I'll just suffer to be so now. He probably could have tried to explain it to John. They would, John would have been scratching his head and going, what? Water? Where? <laughs> um, what it, what it pictures also for us is that we're underwater. You know when you say your, your house is, uh, you bought your house for so much and now it's, it's, it's worth so little <laughs> because the bubble burst on you? You're underwater in that debt, right? We're underwater in debt, and the debt's sin. And Jesus Christ came down under the water to pay that sin debt. That's the picture. Um, the Bible refers to watery separation from God. Look at, um, oh, let me just read you three verses, you can write them down. Psalm 88, 7, The wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Psalm 18, 16, He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters. Again, I believe the first, that's found in 2 Samuel, also in Psalm 18, so it's mentioned twice. Psalm 69, verse 14 and 15, Deliver me out of the mire, let me not sink, let me be delivered from them that hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the water flood overflow me, neither let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. So, the picture is that God's had, God had to put that body of water there for all kinds of reasons, but probably the main reason is that if this universe is exposed to a holy and righteous God, it'll burn up. And that thing's a buffer right there. And we're under that thing, and we're underwater, literally. A body of water above our heads that's above this universe. Um, and this is why the first four disciples chosen are professional fishermen. He said there in Matthew 4, 18, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew's brother, casting a net uh, into the sea, for they were fishers. Then in Matthew 4, 21, And going on from thence, he saw two, two brethren, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, and mending their nets, and he called them. I think, some, I think these two families may have worked together at times. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Isn't that interesting? First four disciples are professional fishermen. He said, I'll make you fishers of men. He's under the water. He's going to show them how to fish for men. Uh, even in, there are verses in the Bible that even teach us that um, men under this water are likened to fish. Uh, Ecclesiastes 9.12, it's interesting, they're fish and birds. <laughs> um, for man also knoweth not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net... And as the birds that are caught in a snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. Fishes in a net, birds caught in a snare. Habakkuk 1.14, And make us men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. So he likens us unto fish. So he calls four professional fishermen and says, I'll make you fishers of men. Now, like I said, just as... Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ comes through that body of water, and of course he'd make a channel to get through that body of water. Um, Christians go up through this water at the rapture. And I told you the picture of this is the Red Sea. Uh, it's a perfect picture because Moses is a type of Christ. The children of Israel picture the church. They're, they're called a church in the wilderness in Acts chapter 7. Because <laughs> um, the word church means a called out assembly. Right? And they were called out of Egypt into the wilderness. So they're a church in the wilderness. Okay, Don't confuse it with the church, uh, the body of Christ. That's different. You could, there's other churches. There's local churches in the Bible. There's the body of Christ. There's Israel. 
Um, I think even they may have been likened unto a church even in Abraham's bosom because they were congregated there. Um, but you have children, the children of Israel picture the church. Pharaoh and his army are a type of the devil and his angels. And you find that in the book of uh, Ezekiel where it says that when they all perished that Pharaoh was comforted. Well, what actually happened in history is Pharaoh himself died in the Red Sea with his armies. So the type has to be the devil uh, who, is, who is comforted that people perished. Um, the Red Sea is a type of the great deep. Where that channel was made, remember they went through dry shod, okay, which is an amazing thing. Now, you think that's amazing. Wait till he opens up that great deep and we're going through there. Talk about walls of water. Talk about a channel. And listen, the water, there's a cloud uh, above them and on two sides of water. You know, I mean, it was like going through a tunnel. And that's basically what it's going to be like for us, is going through a tunnel through that great deep. He's just going to split that thing open. Just like, he did the, just like Moses did the Red Sea. And I don't know if you know about riverbeds, but the, the mud and the water goes down 20, 30, I mean, 40 feet. And yet they went across dry shod kicking up dust. That goes to show you it wasn't, it wasn't some... Um, you see, it reads, yeah, it could have been that. That was a greater miracle, brother. You got Pharaoh and his armies drowning in two inches of water. Um, okay, that's enough I want to say about that. That could be. He'll bow the heavens. Who knows? I know this. We're traveling at an enormous rate of speed. Now, because we have the Red Sea as a picture, the sea that, that is above our universe was once colorless, but now it is red, like the Red Sea. Uh, and I realize the Red Sea is probably not red, but um, it's got the name, and it's a picture and a type. Now, here's something that, you know, I don't know everything about this and don't even begin to know everything about it, but um, let me give you a couple verses here. In Hebrews 8, 5, it says, Who serve under the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that you make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. In other words, what Moses was building in that tabernacle was to picture something that's in heaven. What scale? I, I have no idea. It's probably, I'm sure it was scaled down. But Hebrews 9, 22 to 23 says this, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns, now this is what Moses did, that necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. Blood. It wasn't just blood on the mercy seat. It wasn't just blood on the altar. It's blood on everything. They sprinkled everything with that blood. And we come to find out that's a pattern of something else. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Heavenly things. What we find out is that that blood, of, uh, and because of what it is, it is eternal. Because it is God's blood. Acts 20:28 20, says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now it says God purchased that with his own blood. That blood is eternal. You say, well, didn't it just spill out and dry up at the cross? Something may have dried up there, but the, the blood itself, God's blood, it's eternal. It's an eternal liquid. Uh, Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal... How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now here's what I want you to think about. That blood purges our sins. Okay? That blood purges our sins. Now usually the only time something is purged or... Or, or the, or the uh, forgiveness is offered is when the blood is applied physically to it. And what I'm going to tell you is that uh, the blood gets applied physically to you. 
and I. Because it is all around us. Um, lost a thought, but maybe it'll come back. First uh, John 5, 7, and 8, and this, this goes way over me. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's the Trinity. That goes way over my head. And then the next one's not any easier, I don't think. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. So this blood that's shed at Calvary is God's blood. And I learned this from just working in chemistry and laboratories and everything that, man, you, you can... You can put the smallest amount of substance in, uh, let's say we took an Olympic-sized swimming, swimming pool, put a teaspoon of something in there, or even less. We have instrumentation that would read it, that would tell you how much is in that swimming pool, even though it's dispersed over a million gallons. I don't know how many, how many gallons are in an swim, uh, Olympic-sized swimming pool, but let's say, let's say it's 100,000 gallons. You can drop a tablet in there or something, and there's probably a device that we have today that would measure and still see it, even though it's dispersed. So is the blood of Christ. It's dispersed, and it is, it is all around us, and it exceeds even into the heavens. <clears throat> um, and I was going to say something, I can't remember. Okay, Revelation 20.11 uh, that sea somehow is infused with the blood of Christ. Now, oh, I know what I was going to say. You say, well, that means the blood's all around us. We're all saved. Well, no, no, no. It didn't say the blood's applied. It just said the blood is there. Why does it have to be everywhere? Didn't, didn't, the, didn't the creation fall? I mean, didn't nature fall? Doesn't it have to be redeemed? So it is throughout heaven and earth. This blood is there. And especially at earth, it says the spirit, the water, and the blood. Now start running references on those things. I mean, out of his side came water and blood, evidently picturing two different natures, a divine nature and a human nature, but yet it's God's blood as a man. So, this sea does disappear. And when it disappears, God's able to create a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. Because the, I guess, because the, um, and this is what I think, and, and I could be wrong, but I'll tell you what I think. I don't think anything disappears completely. It, it disappears, but it doesn't go away. There's enough room out in outer space. One thing I learned about from listening to these guys and these programs and stuff is there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of space out there. And God can dissolve the entire creation to where it disappears and the building blocks are still there. All he has to do is just reassign them. What God doeth, he doeth forever. That's just a thought. You see, what well, it burns with a fervent heat. Yeah, it burns, but it's still there, right? It just goes to show you when God does something, you can't take anything away from Him. When we talk about so you know, the, the Calvinists and sovereignty, that's sovereignty. You can't destroy anything I've made. You might reduce it to something else right now, but I'll put it right back to what it should be. What well, just shows you how weak man is. He thinks he's so smart, atomic bomb, and still, he, it's all still there. Okay, um, the sea, this sea we're talking about, the deep, has opened twice in the past and will open twice in the future. Uh, these openings are typified by the crossings of Moses, Joshua, Elijah, and Elisha. Moses crossed the Red Sea, Joshua crossed Jordan, and so did Elijah and Elisha cross the Jordan, and where it literally parted for them, and they crossed. Um, I'm, I would imagine the two openings he's talking about, I don't know for sure, but would be, I don't know. I was going to say Christ at his first coming, but I don't know if that's the case or not. And being born, but I guess it is, yeah. He had to come down through the waters, and then he ascended up through those waters. That's the first two times, and there's going to be two more. 
Um, it may be talking about raptures there. I'm not sure. Because when Christ arose, they ascended with him. Okay. Anyway. Um, now, where man has rejected the truth of this revelation, Paul prays he will understand it. Now, look at Ephesians 3, 18 and 19 real quick. And then I'm about done. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19. A lot of people read this wrong. It says, may be able to comprehend, I mean, understand something here, with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And then they say, to know the love of God. No, you forgot that little conjunction there. And, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. So what he's talking about being able to comprehend, the love of Christ is beyond that. But he says that you might be able to comprehend this. What? What is the breadth, length, depth, and height? Of what? We've got to be talking about this universe and our world. I believe that I, I believe we have a, a you know a better understanding of uh, I, we don't know we don't know what the breadth, length, depth, and height are, but I'll bet you it's in that book somewhere. Now, this hasn't escaped um, Christian hymnology because we sing about it, we just don't think about it when we're singing it. For example, uh, there's a song called Crossing the Bar. And he's not talking about the liquor bar. Uh, on Jordan's Stormy Bank. I mean, you ever think why you're singing those songs? Cast a wishful eye <laughs> to Canaan's fair and happy land, you know. Where my possessions lie, I won't have to cross Jordan alone. And we're talking about going through some water. Uh, in the song Jesus Saves, it says, Echo back ye ocean waves. Even though, you know, the people writing these songs, I, I'm not sure if they understood it or not, but they kind of understood that we're crossing over, and it's a body of water that we're crossing over. Um, sweet by and by says, we shall sing on that beautiful shore. Haven of rest, I'll sail the wide seas no more. Swing low, sweet chariot. Negro spiritual, looked over Jordan and what did I see? But a band of angels coming for to carry me home. <laughs> I have a home beyond the river. When the roll is called up yonder, one of the verses says, when the sage of verse shall gather over on the other shore. Now that, there's 900, almost 1,000 songs in that new songbook. I, I have no idea how many of them deal with this. Hundreds. Why? Because we're under a body of water. Science doesn't know it yet. They'll, they probably will never figure it out. I don't think God will let them. God will not be, uh, God will not be ogled by your telescope or by your microscope. Uh, he will not be put to test by all the tests that you have. He's not going to be subjected to it. He'll not be found in a Petri dish. He will not let man find him out, but by faith in the Word of God. And that's why science can look and look and look. Oh, they can, they, can, they can discover things. They can come up with theories and the theories be right, but they never get to the bottom of anything like the theory of, of, of the atomic structure and everything. They, they, it's a theory because they haven't got to the bottom of it. Why? They, they don't know what it is. You keep breaking it down and you finally get down to, okay, we're down to this. Quirks or whatever they call them things. Now what do we do with it? What is it? How come when you split it, it a lot of power comes out of it? What's the power? They harness it, but they don't know what it is. So they don't know as much as you think they do. And the Bible's telling you things they have no idea. I know what it is. It's, the, it's God's power is what it is. And that's the way it is for most everything. That's why they're always theorizing because they never get to, they never get to the bottom of anything because they don't know why. They've rejected this. So, yeah, they get the atomic structure right. They get the, um, uh, the, the chart, a periodic element of chart, or a 
periodic chart of elements. They get that thing up, and maybe they've even got them all. I don't know. Probably not. They teach you all kinds of laws of science and everything. Laws. Laws? You mean like from a lawgiver? Why is there laws in a chaotic system? There's still laws. And yet, they deny the God of this book. So they can never see his signature. They can never see, they can never see him. That's why, and listen, that's why I reject some of this stuff that's going on about a flat earth. And I'll tell you why. That's a signature. And God's not going to let him have a what People that believe in a flat earth have to believe that just about everybody around us that's scientific knows about this, but the Christians don't. That's insane. Um, the scientists, if they, if they were able to observe this, would know that there is a God. They cannot find him out, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, by searching. And uh, one of, uh, I'm starting to reject heliocentricity and geocentricity. I think we're on the backside of some nebula somewhere. And I think we are on the backside of an S-shaped nebula, to be honest with you. But I, I, don't, think, I don't think we're the center of anything. Because that's a signature. And it says they cannot find out. If we are, they'll never be able to prove it one way or the other. They'll never be able to prove it scientifically. Why? God refuses, refuses to show a man the truth that rejects this. He refuses to. You will not find him out. You'll search all your lifetime and, and, and die with a beard down to here, all gray-headed, and go to the grave, and you'll still not know any more about God than the day you were born because you reject his revelation. Now that's where I'm coming from these days and looking over this stuff. And I'm telling you, the amount of information out there is staggering and some of it is compelling. But the Bible has to be the final authority on these things and I, you don't get the answer to the argument. It becomes a philosophical argument. When I mean philosophical, I mean it's an argument between God and man. And God says, I'm not showing you. You'll never find it out. Search. Go ahead. Search the heavens. Get your Hubble telescope. They've upgraded the thing three times. They've went to space and upgraded it three times. They can see farther and farther and farther than they've ever been able to see. We are talking thousands of light years away from this planet. And you know what they found? Just more nebula, more stars, more constellations. Just bigger, more. Did they see God? Did they see him eyeballing looking back at him? Did they see any proof? As a matter of fact, the more it seems like they look, the more they reject the God of this book. I'll tell you what, if, if what they, it, you'd have to be crazy to believe it, like I said, the second law of thermodynamics. But if you were to believe it, I don't know how you keep from killing yourself. I'm being honest with you, because you're nothing. You're not even a speck of dust in this universe, and you don't matter. So you live your 70, 80 years. Poof, you're gone. That's it? Do you really believe that? I've never believed that a day in my life. I've always felt like the, the being that I am, somehow I'm eternal, one way or the other. I've always believed that. I think God puts that in every man until some idiot educates you out of it or tries to convince you otherwise. But if you want to find him out, there's where you start. And it puts you way ahead of the scientists. See, I don't even have to go to school to, to, to be ahead of them. All I have to do is read and believe that. <laughs> That's nice. It's not wrong. It's not bad to know some things. It's not bad to be able to um, um, understand some science. I'm talking about real science, not false science. I think that's a good thing because, like I said, if God, if this created, the Word created this, this and that have to agree. Hands down. And if somebody gets this and that, somebody's wrong somewhere, either here or there. Or maybe both. They just got it all wrong. But this, this has not got it wrong. You can interpret it wrong, but it's not wrong. Okay. Am I done? Psalm 29, 10, The Lord sitteth upon the flood, yea, the Lord sitteth king forever. 
Psalms 24, 1 to 3, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. He hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? What's interesting here is, that just as we have that picture up there of Mount Zion, and the sides of the north, we have a, a pattern of that thing down here with Jerusalem. It's the same thing. You ascend upward. And that's called Mount Zion. This is called Mount Zion. The one on earth is called Mount Zion. You see how we have these pictures and patterns of everything that, that are down here? And the battle went from this, that he could not ascend the sides of the north, to down here where he will try to ascend the sides of the north of Jerusalem, which is Mount Zion, where God's seat is, just like it was up there. You see that? We just scaled down. I mean, he, he still got the same plan. It's just that uh, he had to change locations. And the Lord's given him the opportunity for this. Okay. Whew. Any questions or comments? I don't know. I don't know. That's a good, well, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of people that I would think, Elijah? Um, so when Doc says that he, uh, it's open twice before and twice in the future, he didn't specify those two openings. So I'm in the dark about that. Yeah, well, he didn't because he, he, no one of the dead go there. For God took him. Well, it's obvious that one of the t openings he's talking about is the church because the picture in, in the Old Testament of the children of Israel, we're the children of God, we're going to go through that great deep. So that's one of the openings right there. Now he's making him swim. He's, he's an aquatic dragon. I don't know how he cast him down. Well, I mean, he's not going to cast, I don't think he's going to cast the physical dragon. I mean, he's probably bigger than the earth. But um, spiritually, he's just going to be put down here. Somehow, I don't know. Those, those things bewilder me. But anyway, any other questions or comments? We will conclude the gap.